so just for safety, just thing. click again on this one, so just to don't. So do I don't turn it on. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we're, we're good over here on the magnet. Yeah. Uh, yep. Oh, yep. 5G EV drops. Beam for Schools is an international science competition for high school students from all around the world. Teams of at least five students and one adult team coach can propose an experiment, which can then be performed at a beam line using a particle beam. And we then invite the winning teams for about two weeks with full cost covered to perform their experiments together with professional scientists. And there are also more attractive prizes to win. And each year, the deadline for proposal submission is end of March. And a simple creative idea is all it takes to take part in this unique competition. In 2019, the winners of Beamline for Schools are two teams from the Netherlands and the US. The team particle peers from the Predenius Gymnasium in Groningen in the Netherlands consists of five girls and one boy. They decided to investigate experimentally the shape of a shower of particles that is created when a very fast electron hits a target made from a dense material such as tungsten. They also want to find out if the shape changes when the electrons are replaced by anti-electrons. The second winning team called itself Daisy Chain and consists of four girls and four boys. They are from West High School in Salt Lake City in the US. Their imagination was captured by scintillators. These are materials that emit light when a high energetic charged particle interacts with them. The team wants to measure the efficiency of different materials and find out if these scintillators work with anti-electrons in the same way as with normal matter. At first I was really scared because I, I came here, I'm expecting to have these super tall blonde Netherlands people looking down on me. Uh, that, that's not what happened. Uh, it's actually really nice to get to know everyone. I'm really looking forward to communicating as a group because I think it's really important to sort of, I mean it sounds cheesy, but like communicate across countries just because it's one of those things that you don't get to do very often. And I think this is an opportunity to work as a team with people that are different from you. So, I don't know, I think it's getting to know each other on a whole new level. I, I am looking uh, forward to uh, working with the American team and also uh, sharing our thoughts on their experiments and our experiments. You know, I have never seen a particle accelerator experiment before and I think it's going to be something that um, is going to possibly change my life and I think, yeah. First, we're going to learn so much <laughs> and also not only learn information but also uh, how we could really work on it in, in, in real life, so how to, how to use it technically. Yeah, and also a lot of fun with the other scholars and yeah. But also I'm excited to see how we fix things, like if there is a problem, yeah. how we... Uh, so uh, we made a little group. Uh, from our classmates and then we started to think of a well first we started to learn something about particle physics because we didn't uh, know a lot about particle physics we've only seen it on paper so um, we didn't have really a good concept of like the size or like how much detail goes into it I guess I mean um, but yeah actually walking in there and seeing it was like whoa <laughs> you know seeing all of the parts together and how they work it's like yeah that's super cool well, we're trying to find out if uh, the shape of a particle shower um, is the same for uh, if you start with electrons or the antiparticle uh, pos positrons. If you look at the standard model, the, all the everything we know about antimatter and its matter, you would say no, there shouldn't be a difference, but there might be some exceptions, but uh, that, that the chance it happens is very small. Um, so we're looking at scintillators, which is a type of detector that um, gives off light when a particle passes through it. And generally you get more light as your particle energy goes up, but it's not quite linear, not quite proportional. Uh, and it's described by a law, Burke's law, which just says this is how much light you're going to get out based on the quenching. And so we're looking at the scintillators they have here and seeing the constant that's different for each scintillator 
and what the law looks like for electrons and positrons. <laughs> Welcome to the DZ testing facility. Welcome to your experiment, actually. Behind these huge walls, there's a DZ2 accelerator. As you know, the DZ2 accelerator, well, with some steps in between, will generate our particle beam compound. So the beam will enter the area back there and traverse, well, hopefully not the full area, but uh, will be stopped somewhere, depending on the experiment. Uh, you walk by this very nice um, shiny box that you can see here, which is what we call the dark box. Um, we put your scintillator for the DZ chain experiment in there, um, wrapped it a bit, um, and it's light tight in order to, to, to cover all the light and not to have the PMT receiving well, light from, uh, from the environment. Back here, uh, three planes of the Mimosa telescopes, which are there for the tracking before the magnet. And then, well, well, obviously a big red magnet, um, <laughs> very big one. Then next here, we have the, um, the first plane of the Micromegas. Uh, so this is a one dimensional detector. It just gives us a position along what we call the X axis. And you can see on the top, there's a board which, ha which has some fans above it. That is the readout electronics. Uh, and that's one of the new equipment we have for this year. Um, I don't know. I really like the way that they were really hands-on. I mean, one thing I kind of expected, like working on a particle accelerator, would be like sitting in a room with a computer and like typing in a variable and that changes it. But there's really a lot of like hands-on stuff. Like today, I um, adjusted a bunch of screws to put the pressure right on an electrical circuit. And like, I don't know, it's really nice working on stuff like that. Yeah, it was amazing to see the experiments just mind-blowing that it really happens and it's really happening. And yeah, it's so much fun to see that it works. and. We can start measuring tomorrow and yeah. Yeah, I mean up until now it was purely theoretical and so I don't know, this is never an experience I thought I'd get because in Utah there's really just nothing like that anywhere near us and so. So channel one is the yellow channel. Um, let's set here the trigger level and we should sooner or later start seeing some noise. Okay, so you see every now and then we see a pulse. Well, and Christopher are really good mentors. They um, can explain everything as often almost as you want. Um, you have these questions, you can ask them. They know what to do when something goes wrong, but they also know that sometimes we have to do it ourselves. We have to see what's going on, um, why is it like this. So I think they found a really good balance in this and they're just fun to work with. Which means, well, a small particle beam will actually enter the area. I uh, will do that right now. And if you look up there, you can actually see test beam 21, hopefully on. Next slide. Oh, there there it is. The fun part about it is, of course, when you take regular data. Um, since we have the students also around, there's a lot of teaching. And you just have a bit more time when taking regular data to explain things. Um, for the debugging, usually time is a bit critical since we want to get the experiment running. But once we get it running, you can just well, teach a bit. You can explain them how the things actually work uh, and well how to take good data and optimize. And then well help the students learn actually programming, uh, help them to to well, dive into into our world a little bit like more. Oh, there we go. <gasps> we got something. Oh my goodness. We have life. <laughs> So, no. It's alive. It's alive. But not planning on falling. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> it really seems feasible. Like, they don't seem too far off. They, like, they feel like we can do everything. Like, half the time we ask them questions, they're like, oh, you figure it out. Like, I'm just going to give you the means to figure it out. And so it's like, it's not intimidating at all, I think, because, like, they're just like, we, we honestly end up doing so much in the experience. It's like kind of insane. Yeah, I definitely think that more people will. Uh, compete in the beamline for schools competition and I think more students will be interested in particle physics because of this uh, opportunity we got. We really see it happening in our own class. They're like, oh what are you doing? What's yeah. the project? And then we can explain and they're really excited. The last few days were the real shift days. So every day we had three shifts and um, every shift crew was on one of them. So we did uh, all sorts of things. We did some alignments, some calibrations, but also we took real data for uh, both the particle peer team, but also for the American team. So that's fun, so they can start analyzing it. 
the last uh, time we changed the scintillators. So we had all different kinds of scintillators. We had thicker ones, thinner ones. We even have one from another material. But we also have all kinds of different detectors we can um, use. So we have now, for example, the delay wire chamber over there. But we also have uh, some micromegas, um, more calorimeters. So we have a lot of a uh, lot of things to use to have beautiful data. Well, I have very fun uh, shift crews. We do uh, all kinds of things. We do, of course, the data taking, but we also sometimes uh, just have conversations because the data taking takes long times. So we uh, talk about um, their normal lives, how their school goes, but also very silly things sometimes. <laughs> We use some duct tapes and tin foil, so that's quite normal objects to use for difficult setups. But I think also um, to see how every detector is connected to each other and how we get the data all along. So um, what happens if you change one thing in our setup? What happens to the other? Okay, we're going to move the stage up. Good? Okay. You Okay, so today is VIP day, so basically we're here with the other team and all of the VIPs, so like representatives from our country and also the Netherlands and also the local region and all the sponsors of the Beamline for Schools program, both at DAISY and CERN, and we're going to present to them and vice versa about what we're doing with the program this year. And I'm very happy to be here with you today uh, to help you to celebrate your great and wonderful accomplishment. Um, I want you to take a look around the room and know that we're all here to celebrate all of you and your accomplishments and the teamwork that you have demonstrated. You've come to Hamburg as high school teams. By the time you return to, to your home and your communities, you will realize that you belong to a much larger and international team. So uh, my name is Darian Akins. I'm the new American Consul General here in Hamburg. Science is an important part of what we do is collaborative, it's cooperative, it's something that we do jointly. I think that's a wonderful skill for the students to learn early in life and being able to work with these two groups from two different countries together to collaborate on a project, I find to be extraordinary and a good example of the kind of cooperation we need, not just in science, but all around the world. I'm uh, Koen Schuiling. I'm mayor of the city of Groningen. Groningen is a city in the northern part of the Netherlands. Well, I'm very happy that uh, DAISY is uh, organizing these things because young people, they need an environment which is stimulating them uh, and it's also rewarding them for fundamental science. And that's actually what's happening here. Young people meet elderly, more experienced people. They have all the things they need. And I think what's so nice about DAISY that people in interacting with each other in uh, science. So that's actually what's happening here. It's very nice to see. So for many years, the Willem and Elsa Reus Foundation has supported a wide variety of activities aimed at getting high school students interested in physics. In addition to school laboratories and student research centers, these include competitions such as Jugendforscht or International Young Physicists Tournament. The special feature of the Beamline of Schools competition is, however, that the students carry out their own projects at a research center such as CERN or DESI, supported by real researchers. This undoubtedly contributes to a higher motivation and a sustained interest in the subject and is therefore entirely in line with our goals. My name is Jasper van Zon. I work for a company called Arconic and today I represent the Arconic Foundation. Beamline for Schools is very important to the Arconic Foundation and Arconic because it's one of those programs where you can really see that science is connecting with young people. And let's not forget that young people 
are the entrepreneurs, the engineers, the scientists and the decision makers of the future. That's why we find it very important to contribute to their development. Also, uh, we, we spent a while setting up the detectors, so try not to disturb anything. Okay. <laughs> All right. is the beam telescope. It's, we have the six sensors. Uh, Yannick explained it during our presentation. They're like your camera. When a particle comes through, you have a signal, and the signal will give almost a picture of particles. So um, normally we have tungsten in between, and the amount of tungsten will um, say how big the shower will be. So right now we w won't have a shower because the tungsten, our absorber, isn't in there. So it will almost be a straight line to the side right now. So here you see the five um, slides, and uh, in the text in the paper you have the tungsten. So it costs 700 euros right now. Oh. So we have to be very careful with it. In the last few days, we we had a lot of action. We were of course well first. Well, debugging our detectors, debugging the experiments, but then just taking regular data, helping with the data analysis. So we actually now, from well, having nothing, having nothing at, at data, we actually went for, uh, went to seeing some very nice plots this morning with almost the, the results that we actually wanted to see. I've, I've been very impressed with most of the students. Of course, there's always one or two that, that impress us a bit more, maybe a bit more knowledge, or maybe they, they come up with this question that we weren't expecting. But the simple fact that these, all these students were able to come up with this idea, with this experiment, uh, and well, essentially they won a uh, competitive review process. So just that fact, I mean, we're already very impressed with all of them. Our philosophy at my school was that it very much was a student-led experiment. And so they did most of the work and I could go in and they, they would come to me with questions, you know, uh, what is this particle and what does this do? And I sometimes didn't have an answer but oftentimes I had at least a better starting point than they did. Uh, one student in particular has never even taken a physics class in my uh, school because I haven't taught her physics. And I was talking to her the other day and she is like now considering a, becoming a physics major, not even like, oh yeah, I think about doing science, but to become a physicist herself. So I think that the program really exposes um, kids to the idea of science and uh, allows them to move their career in a way. The biggest difference between school science and living science is that you um, here you see that there are open questions, that there are problems. In school science there it's, it's set in stone and you, you the, the questions already always have a, a right answer and uh, so that's not real science actually that's that's really annoying about school science that you um, it can be very boring for students because they're saying where is the creativity there's always a right answer so we only have to find that it's very important that students see this because this makes students enthusiastic well it what, what it will do it will uh, show that uh, physics is fun uh, and as long as you have fun in your what you're doing it helps to make a choice to go into that direction because uh, many students go into physics because they say, yeah, I want to do this very fundamental research. I want to know the theory of everything. And there are other students that want to do just fun with their research. They want to really have nice research, nice colleagues. Uh, and this is often uh, not very visible in uh, science research, especially for physics. And this is a team project. So th this is something where uh, Beamline for schools can show that if you work together in a team, uh, you can yeah, make a nice experiment, you reach a result. I think as a team we've all grown a lot because we're learning to communicate. I remember maybe when we submitted our proposal in March, something like that, uh, we didn't really talk that much. I, I think we finally learned to get over it. We had a pretty big shouting match over one of our presentations. And then it all clicked. It was magic. I um, always like to know how things work and uh, why something is the way it is. And I think it's very fun for me to see how research goes on a normal day in a normal life. I would like to say thank you to CERN and Daisy 
because everything uh, that's here is mostly possible because they started beamlining for schools. It's just that all the people here are so kind, uh, so nice and just so so understanding and patient, which I, I just really respect. And uh, yeah, it's just way more fun. Um, I think for CERN and DAISY, I, I say thank you for supplying this experience. Uh, I don't think it's something that you could get anywhere else. We're given this amazing opportunity and we can either choose to go with it 100% and try everything that we can, or we can kind of tone it back. So I'm just trying to give my all so that I can decide whether or not I really do enjoy physics. I think that my biggest motivation is to really discover what physics is to me uh, and to view it as a curiosity, not necessarily as a checklist.